A question that I'm often asked is why is on-market land so expensive? Um, and really the simple answer is it's the way that they put a valuation on that land. Um, so in this video I'm going to explain the process that an estate agent goes through to put the value on the land and through that you'll understand why it tends to be so expensive. The antithesis of that of course is what you should be doing to find land that makes sense, gives you a viable proposition uh, to be able to carry out your development project. And I do cover that in my book, You a Property Developer, and you can get a copy for yourself uh, by going to the website youapropertydeveloper.com um, and you can get a copy of the book just for the price of postage and packaging. So with that said, uh, let's get stuck into the video. Um, oh, incidentally, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, it really helps us. Anyway, uh, so how does an estate agent value land? Well, first of all, what they do is that they take the same principles that they would apply to valuing houses, because they have very little experience in actually marketing land, and they don't tend to be terribly good at it, in all honesty. Um, I had a situation when I contacted an agent five times for one piece of land that I was wanting to view, and they couldn't fix an appointment with the landowner with me. Um, I went direct to the landowner uh, through a technique that we use in terms of we don't actually know who it is you can go to the architect uh, who actually drew up plans because this one had planning permission in place and then uh, we were able to contact them anyway that's that's a, a side note so when they actually uh, look at land uh, they are uh, or in other words to market a house what they do is they they look at comparables in the area. So they will look at for things that have recently sold are, are over the last 12 months. And, and they'll look at several uh, particular properties. So let's say there's a three or four bedroom house. Let's say it's a four bedroom house. And they'll look for four bedroom houses in that area that sold. And then they'll look at the actual structure of those houses because four bedrooms doesn't necessarily mean um, a particular size of house because you can have a very large four bedroom house. You can have a small four bedroom house. But they'll typically try and look for something that's similar to what they are uh, looking to sell. Um, and so therefore then they will look at the market sentiment. Is the market rising or is the market flat or is the market somehow tailing off? And they will then make an assessment what can be reasonably, uh, what they believe reasonably can be fetched for that particular house. And they'll set a price uh, in that respect. And that's when it goes on the market. So when it comes to land, they use a similar uh, process. So, and, and they tend to deal generally in only single build plots, um, or they might uh, they might deal in some multiple uh, multiple plots, might be three, four, five houses sometimes. Um, and what they'll do is they'll look at for land in the area that is has sold recently. Um, and maybe not even just recently, maybe over the last few years, and then again, uh, based on market sentiment, they will fix the price. The problem with that is that that's not how you value land. Uh, but they don't have that understanding. And let's be honest, their main criteria is to try and get the best price for the person that they are representing. And of course, if it's an attractive proposition, uh, particularly if it's a single plot, um, it will tr attract interest. Uh, mainly the interest it will attract from people who are self-builders. And for them, it's an emotional decision based on uh, somewhere that they want to live. And there's nothing wrong with that um, because uh, if that's something that, that you want and that you like, the, if it's got a particular view, which makes it even more valuable, um, then you're going to be interested in it. And particularly if it's got planning permission in place, that will indeed make it more interesting because now you don't have to go away and get planning. Uh, but there's a danger there uh, because there's several types of planning and the two principal ones are outline planning and full planning. Full planning means that everything is in place in 
order for you to build. In other words, the drawings have been done, it's been approved, um, and all you need to probably do now is apply for building control regulations, unless that's been done. But rarely that is that the case. Usually if it's full planning, that's as far as it's gone. Um, outline planning is very different because outline planning simply means that in principle, you can build something within that area. Uh, they might sometimes determine the actual size of the structure, but beyond that, there's not an awful lot uh, being put in place. Here's the danger, is that uh, there's no guarantee that you will get full planning even with outline planning being put in place. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a liability that you need to be aware of. Or you may get something, but you may not get something of the size that you're looking to be put in place. And that's important when you come to the valuation of land, of knowing what actual structure you can put on there. Because if you put a, a, a 100 square meter house on there, or you put a, a 300 square meter house, obviously the valuation of that property is going to be markably different. And it's the end valuation that is really important when you make the calculation uh, for actually establishing what the value of that particular piece of land. The second thing that they don't really understand is that depending on what's beneath the ground there, uh, there could be real cost implications. So you can have two pieces of land sitting right next to, uh, to each other and they would have different valuations. An estate agent is not going to make that distinction. And the reason that they could have different valuations is because the ground conditions could be different. So there could be uh, uh, an area which requires what we call grouting, which basically means there's a big space in the ground, and what the way that you solve that is putting a lot of concrete Concrete is obviously not cheap, and therefore that adds to the expenditure of your build. Um, and uh, the other piece may not have that situation. So that creates a different valuation because clearly uh, the, the value of that land will be less by at least the value of the uh, concreting, uh, uh, the, the, yeah, the concreting that you're going to actually have to put into the ground in order to make that a viable proposition. Um, uh, the, the other thing is that when you buy on market land, you're going to have to pay for it up front. Uh, whereas what you really should be doing as a developer is you should be securing an option agreement while you get everything in place and before you're ready to actually do the build itself. So going back to the single plot, which might be on the market, um, and is attractive now to several self-builders who are getting frustrated because they can't find land because there's so much competition, the values are so high, then you are going to get into a bidding war which is going to further push up the price, which then to the estate agent justifies the price tag that they put on it. As a developer, that does not work because what you're doing is you're stripping out all the profit. And after all, why be a developer if there's no profit in there? So you need to learn how to source off-market land. And that's the fundamental difference from a developer, from a self-builder. Developer is, is really making a commercial decision. A self-builder might be making a commercial decision, but is also making an emotional decision and therefore is prepared to, for the right location to pay a premium for that piece of land. You as a developer can't afford to do that. You've got to make sure it stacks up. You've got to make sure that if you buy a piece of land that has full planning in place, then you can still make your bill profit of 25% of the gross development value, which is the total value of that site once, in other words, that you're going to sell it for. I'm talking about the built out site. And you need to then, if you have to go away and gain planning on it, then you need to be making a land uplift profit uh, which you're going to share with the land owner because what you're doing is increasing the value of that land to its new price with the planning in place because that's what actually adds value uh, to the land. Another thing to be aware of on off-market land is that very often uh, you will find that uh, estate agents will advertise full planning in place and you will find when you actually go to investigate it that the planning has been lapsed and yet so that what that means is that you are going to have to reapply for planning so it doesn't actually have planning in place you're going to have the expenditure of that and you're going to have the risk 
because some because something had planning before doesn't necessarily mean it will gain planning the next time time round. Regulations have ch may have changed. The boundary may have changed. It may have now no longer be in the settlement boundary where it was previously. For a whole raft of reasons, there is no guarantee that if you have uh, uh, if you got a, a piece of ground that previously had planning, uh, that it will gain planning, and therefore the valuation should not be the same as a, a, a piece of ground that has planning in place. And yet, very often, you will find that estate agents don't make that distinction. Um, and I'm talking about uh, sometimes uh, planning that has lapsed several years before. Uh, the other thing is that they might say to you, we have made a significant start. Well, the thing to check there is if they're saying that they've made a significant start, you need to go back to the planners and make sure that they agree a significant start has been made. If a significant start has been made, and that's usually some concrete in the ground, not just digging a few uh, trenches or stripping back the site, then um, the, the, the planners will have to recognize that. And uh, so you need to make sure that they understand that because very often, and I've spoken to vendors who, um, or, or landowners who thought that they had planning in place, they had what they believed was a significant start, and yet the planners did not accept that a significant start has been made. So that's something to be to, uh, that you need to be, watch out for. Anyway, a lot of this content is included, as I said, in my book, uh, You a Property Developer. And if you would like a copy, go to youapropertydeveloper.com and you can get it for just the price of postage and packaging. Um, I hope you found that useful. Um, in next week's video, what I'm going to actually cover is how you should actually value a piece of land um, because I think it's important you understand that and we'll cover that in detail of how you actually arrive at the valuation uh, when you are looking to negotiate direct with the landowner rather than through estate agents. Uh, remember to give us a subscribe if you're not already a subscriber and I look forward to speaking to you next week. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>